into what I like to call the Doug Line experience. <laughs> we're going to we're going to jump straight in because we don't we don't beat around the bush here. This is the bush. Yeah, I feel like I'm on between two ferns. Ah, uh, but we've just got the one. I know. Sadly, at least these one is this one real? I think so. Seems it. Keep water in it. <laughs> uh, my first question is. Uh, why do you think social minorities were attracted to the original punk movement from the 1970s? Um, well, the original punk, I mean, I was 13 in 1977, and it was such a different time back then, and the mainstream was everything. There, there wasn't an alternative scene in the same way. No counterculture. Yeah, but it, it, it was... It was anybody who felt like an outsider, which was a lot of people, including myself, quite quickly jumped on board something that was about, you know, you, you can do it yourself. You can, you know, form, play three chords, form a band, put it out on a limited edition single. And, you know, if John Peel played it and he got a review in the NME at the time, that, that was it. That was everything. Yeah. And um, that, that did really create a, a sort of niche scene, but it, wa it was a big do niche. So do you think it was part massively just the lack of that counterculture, the fact that the mainstream was the only stream? Yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, and everything was overblown and big pompous rock bands, too much money, too much coke, all that kind of stuff. Everyone was a bit sick of it, really. It had its day, and punk came to kill the dinosaurs. Do you think? Why do you think sort of the traditional punk style? You know, when you see the people with the like bleached up mohawks and mm. stuff. Why do you think that that sort of change? Do you think it was a loss of popularity or a slow change in the movement? Well, I think that was the second wave of punk that had the big mohawks, really. The first wave of punk in sort of 76, 77 was much more kind of make your own outfits and chop your hair about yeah. and get a dog collar from the pet shop. And you couldn't buy any of those accessories in a shop for those days. You had to kind of make it all yourself. But the sort of Sid Vicious look, really, of the sort of biker jacket and jeans and big boots and studs really took off and then that kind of really took hold in the second wave of punk so what, so but it, it became a uniform and the thing about punk for me was it was a whole the whole point of it was not to be the same i mean it was your tribe but you didn't want yeah. to all look the same as soon as everybody looked the same i think it was dead in the water yeah. style wise really. starts starts leaning towards like the skinhead thing you know of like everyone wearing doc martens and stuff and that leads you into that sort of echo chamber which i guess is exactly what punk is supposed to not be yeah, but then what happens generally is you get a mishmash of things where, you know, you get a bit of skinhead fashion, a bit of mod fashion, mm. a bit of punk, you know, and then the goth thing happened and all those things are still knocking around and probably everything that you lot wear, you know, bits and bobs yeah. of things, it's sort of, they just disappear into the ether after a while. What, what would you say to the, the popular statement when people say that punk is dead? Well look at Pussy Riot I mean you know some some young women in Russia who managed to stick are they it, Russian? Stick I didn't know they were the Russian man and, huh? I didn't know they were Russian I had no yeah, idea they're yeah. like sticking it to Putin sticking yeah. it to the man I mean uh, uh, you know not just at the risk of themselves being put away in prison in probably the worst prisons in the world yeah. and being brave and just saying you know they, didn't, they, they can't even play anything that's as punk rock as you can get some girls jumping up and down making Putin look like a fool that's brilliant so punk as a as a musical form was dead in, in the end of 1977 but as an attitude, as an attitude yeah. it's definitely not dead Pussy Riot are the you know classic example of that do you think there's a need for like the birth of another counterculture another stream as opposed to the mainstream of counterculture or do you think that there's already an alternative in the sense that do you think punk has in a way sort of become its own mainstream which has uh, had a lot of corporate money pumped into it in yeah. the in in 2023 i mean yeah well everything everything outrageous and different gets sort of worn down and commercialized quite quickly but yeah i'm ready for another revolution but that's your job isn't it yeah i suppose so and it's <laughs> not going to come anytime quick well, you're warming up yeah <laughs> yeah no i definitely think we could do another revolution things are worse now than they were then in lots of ways and we haven't learned our lessons and equality is terrible public sectors run down it's all a, it's all a mess but I, I suspect that we're a bit saturated in our society and the next revolution is going to crawl out of a cave in Afghanistan or kind of you know it'll be somewhere that we don't expect I some mishmash of kind of 
different technologies and something that you know yeah, I'd love to see that again I think I, I so would I I just think it's I, I find that the possibility unlikely because it'd be so hard to do that without it just getting tainted by these ideas of these corporates putting in and in inserting yeah. their money in different ways in advertising and stuff like that like going oh turning on the TV and seeing a buzzcock song in the McDonald's advert just you know stuff like that I always think like man what changed you know and I don't think that's the buzzcocks fault that's more sort of just the way we sort of view yeah. punk culture it almost yeah. slipped in I think yeah to the, mainstream, but the thing is that the punk thing had time to kind of mutate and gestate before the media jumped all mm. over it that was different in those days now three bands play the same chord in the same week and everybody thinks it's the next big thing yeah. because everybody wants to market it but I suspect there are people you know in countries that have been bombed that have kind of gone into a cave to do whatever they're doing and they'll come out with a battery powered beatbox and some yeah. you know bits and bobs of old bombs that they've knocked together and I think that'd be amazing I mean I, yeah I mean the thing is now everybody can get everything so it would be amazing wouldn't it some sort of global youth culture comes yeah. up to um, put the world to rights leave a revolution w would you would you say the issue is that people have got so used to these you know these almost like triple a albums all done in studio that people don't see diy as like an option anymore almost like the idea of garage rock and that kind of thing has sort of died off because people are getting sort of fed this this you know high fidelity stuff constantly yeah. well you could DIY you can make an album in your bedroom now can't you with a laptop and release it onto mm. the internet that's the amazing thing about our times but I think people do tend to over over produce things now and that was what was amazing about punk is it wasn't over produced it kept its raw energy and yeah there's definitely a place for a return to that would when you were growing up like you said in the sort of original and second wave scenes did you see that sort of hand-holding between the, the skaters and the punks, or were they just sort of more one scene altogether? No, everything merged quite quickly into lots of different strands, so you ended up with the hippie punk strand, who were like anarcho-punks, like Crass, who had yeah. their own um, commune, and then, you know, the American side of things brought in the skater punk thing, because that was a natural progression of those worlds, and... Um, I mean, I guess that's, and then the hip hop thing kind of merged with that, and I guess that's carried on to this day. I mean, it's outside the college now, isn't it? Mm. That scene is quite resilient. Yeah. Some, th some scenes just roll on forever, and I guess you know, having a skateboard and a couple of cans of cider and a mate is you can entertain yeah. yourself a whole day. for hours yeah. with that. Whether it's got any depth or philosophy now, I, d I, d I don't know. You'd have to ask the people outside. Now, as a finisher here, would you say America? was more influential in terms of the forming of the movement, or Britain was, or would you say that they both handheld through the... No, I think we are hand in, I think we're hand in hand with each other, America and, and UK around films and music, and almost you can't have one without the other. Mm. We need each other as an audience for each other, and we kind of egg each other on and join the dots a bit. I mean, they're very different scenes, but I think they're both valuable. I think it almost felt as well like they were like trying to one up each other almost because you get the Sex Pistols then the Ramones and then you go back to Crass and then you move back to America and then that's time like the bad brains started to become a thing and stuff like that so I, I like that sort of mm. almost unspoken competition of it yeah it was well like it was spoken competition you were yeah, saying the other day weren't you about yeah. Mikey Ramone and John Lydon having an argument about it's it all a hilarious, hilarious video bit, <laughs> all that stuff's quite silly really but I mean Blondie at the time we thought we were a bit of a sellout pop band but then you know Wu-Tang Clan say the first rap they ever heard on the radio was from you know uh, Rapture which was De Debbie Harry mm. rapping so th all sorts of things influence all sorts of things that you don't quite expect you don't you never yeah. know where something's gonna go yeah like it's crazy like Blondie playing at like CBGB's and then you look at today and they're on like you know still going like people's mums is like best of CDs and I'm not I'm not slanting Blondie I'm just saying mm. it's strange how the times change and what m like at the time is seen as like you know anti-conformist slowly moves into the opposite lane as what we you know perceive as conformist changes yeah, I suppose yeah I think that's just inevitable anyway you're the ones ready to start the next revolution aren't you yeah yeah I've, I've, I've bought my AR you know I'm ready for it to happen any day now
Yeah. A- AR, he, that that is something that's coming around the corner. <laughs> I mean, that could be the next revolution. Imagine if the next revolution was actually not human. Humans, yeah. That, be like that's Skynet. Perfectly possible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they say that, but Alexas are terrible. I've know. just I've just wired up my room at home with Alexa and all the plugs and stuff. It's hilarious. I don't like them. I, 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 they can't understand me. You ask them to do something and they mm. to make it so much more difficult. Yeah, well. But it's cool when you see people hook them up to the lights in their houses and stuff. That yeah. that is really cool. I had a friend that had that house. Yeah, like that. that's what I've done. Yeah, that that is pretty. That's like what I see them. It's clearly what they were designed for. Mm. But most people just have them in the kitchen and you can't. You, people try to use it as like a quick Google. Yeah, but it just doesn't. Really, you know, I don't see. It anyway, that give that all another five or ten years, and who knows what we'll be living yeah. with then. I mean, look, they have those auto-driving cars now as well, don't they? Like Tesla, want to get those mm. done. Mm. I can't see that being anything but dangerous. No, really, no. Anyway, off you go and start a revolution. Over and out. Tally ho. Peace Sayonara, out. origato. <laughs> <laughs>